down a step before you get to it. There you go. Thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> Good morning. Can you hear me? I've been told that we're actually alive, and I think that's exciting to be alive. Well, my name is Bill Craddock, and uh, first I want to thank Heidi and the team that's put together the whole adult education forum. It's been terrific. <clears throat> and last, last spring, I was uh, reading a book called, by Isaac Walton called Code Breaker. And it's about CRISPR, which we're going to learn about today. And I was walking in Overton Park, and a good friend of mine, Bill Walker, was walking along with me, and he explained in 10 minutes the whole bow mechanical, ethical structure of CRISPR. Not really. But, um, <clears throat> but it did whet my appetite, and so we thought it would be important for Calvary to, to listen to the structure of CRISPR and its possible implications as we move forward. Bill Walker uh, grew up in California and received a PhD in immunology at uh, University of Southern California, actually in bacteriology. Um, and after several postdoctoral fellowships, he was asked to join the research team at St. Jude's Hospital and was involved with several research projects there. And at the same time, he taught, he was a professor at the University of Tennessee Medical School and University of Memphis and Lemoyne Owen, and he is a wonderful teacher and a great storyteller. He also, at age 35 or 40, decided he needed to learn a new language. And he decided not to learn French or German, but Morse code. Actually, he is a, what do you call a three-tier expert in Morse code. And I went to his house, and he has a little clicker, and he communicates with people all around the world in Morse code. Now, they're short conversations, but... I just think he's got one of those insatiable curiosities and that kind of guy. And, and my other speaker behind me is Dr. Hank Herod, who grew up in Tuscaloosa and went to Princeton uh, for undergraduate major in history and then uh, pursued fellowships uh, in Australia and in New York and ended up uh, at the University of Tennessee Medical School where he became eventually the dean of the medical school. And, as I said, he grew up in Tuscaloosa, so yesterday was a very important day for Hank Herod, um, and for me, since I went to school at the University of Alabama. So we're both kind of bouncy this morning. Apologize for our frisky uh, behavior. <clears throat> As we start, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to explain what CRISPR is. This is all you need to know. It'll be on the, on the test at the end of the... Uh, clustered, regularly interspaced, short, palindropic repeats. No questions, please. And I'll start with a uh, 19th century inventor, Alfred Nobel. He invented dynamite. He found a way to harness the power of nitroglycerin into a package that could be used to blow up uh, mountains and make tunnels and things like that, but also because of the power of, the explosive power of dynamite, he became called the merchant of death. And that was not what, his, what, what he designed it for. But I mention that because dynamite, like some other things, um, are Janus, Janus faced. There's good benefits and there are bad benefits. And how you deal with discoveries can make a huge difference in the life and the society of, of of, of our, and so there are three. You would think there are three major discoveries um, in the 20th century: the atom, the bit, and DNA. Actually, all three were discovered in the 19th century. The atom was discovered by John Dalton in the 1880s. Bits and bytes. And the concept of the computer was also by a fellow named Charles Babbage in the 1890s. 
And then DNA was actually discovered by a German, uh, Frederick Meischer, in the, 19, in the 1880s. Maybe they discovered it, but then over the years, there were numbers of, of improvements or refinements enhancements in the concepts that came about. And you think about Francis and Crick in the 1950s, they said they discovered DNA. Actually, what they discovered was it was a double helix DNA structure. But even since then, things have really changed. So we go back to the question of dynamite, and whoop, I don't want to go there yet. Um, it's important to know that, that our human race is constantly coming up with new technologies and new inventions. The challenge we have is, how do we deal with that? And so today, we're going to have a discussion of the evolution of the human species. We're also going to have a, a more in-depth discussion of CRISPR and the structure of, 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 of the molecule RNA and DNA. And then we're going to address the ethical questions and the theological questions uh, of this discovery. So I'll turn it over now to my friend Hank Herod, Dr. Henry Herod, for a conversation about the evolution. Thank you, Bill Ham. Well, um, one of the remarkable things about mankind, and I think one of the things that may define us, is that we want to be in control. And we've tried to control and manipulate our environment from the very earliest days of mankind or Homo sapiens uh, predecessors. And this is a cartoon that first appeared in 1965 in a Time Life series, and it's totally inaccurate. But it really captures a picture that I think is important, and that is it has been, I think this was labeled actually uh, the March of Progress, but there has been this evolution presumably driven by mutations in different species that have ultimately led to let's see what that the development of the Homo sapiens. Now, one of the things we know, for uh, example, is that this was not a linear boom, 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 boom. At one time, and probably many other times, we had several of these species uh, in existence. Homo sapiens lived at the same times that Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon man lived. They interbred. And most of us in this room, some people more than others, <laughs> have, have some Neanderthalic uh, genes in their genome. But the first early precursors of man were uh, discovered about, or, or existed about five, seven million years ago. In uh, about three million years ago, the first, what is clearly uh, thought of as the uh, precursor, or direct precursor of Homo sapiens, Australopithecus was discovered, and some of you may remember the book by uh, Donald Johnson called Lucy. Lucy was this type of entity. It was a fossil, and they put the pieces together, and it come, named Lucy comes because I, they played that song all during the camp at, uh, where they were doing the diggings. But uh, we move on through these different uh, strains, um, and it's important to know that there were a number, a whole host of others, such as um, uh, Solo Man in China and Rhodesian Man in, in uh, Africa that evolved from these groups but had a dead end. They did not thrive. Why Homo sapiens were the ones that um, made it, we aren't sure. We suspect that it's probably, we like to think that it's because we had some genes that made us a little smarter, allowed us to control ourselves and our environments a little bit better. But that remains to be proven totally. Uh, so <laughs> Homo sapiens um, appeared about uh, 300,000 years ago. And any of these figures can be plus minus hundreds of thousands of years. But best guess is about 300,000 years ago. And then about 50,000 years ago, something called the Great Leap Forward, not Mao's Great Leap, but mankind's great belief occurred, and that's when we begin, we move from just stone tools to more sophisticated developments, technology, boats, bows, needles, uh, things of that sort. And we begin to see examples of representational art in the caves of France. Just in the last month or so, there's been a report of uh, a cave in Indonesia that had some really sophisticated uh, 
drawings in it that were older than the ones we found in Europe thus far. Uh, this was, this was, it's not understood totally why this was a period when this took place, but it's pretty clear that around that time, 30 to 60, 70,000 years ago, is when man began to demonstrate a little more intelligence and a little more creativity. Now, I don't know that you'd call this evolution, but man has continued to march forward, and we see the famous businessman who now has become like myself and probably many others of you with artificial this, that, or the other joints, uh, knees, hips, shoulders. Some of you may have a kidney that didn't come with you. Some of you may have a heart, pancreas. We're doing all sorts of things to manipulate man. It's not evolution, but it's changing the way we were. And, and you can project that somewhere out here, the true cyborg man will, will exist. It'll be a long way, hopefully, from that. But uh, don't be surprised if, well, I don't think any of us would be in this room would live to be there. So some people have said that with all this, we've also done a lot of terrible things, like the atmosphere, like climate change, our destruction of renewable resources that are no longer renewable. So the argument has been made, maybe we ought to just take a deep breath and say, hey, guys, we hadn't done it right. Let's go back. Uh, nobody's going to buy into that. But I, th I love that concept of the stop. So the quest for perfection um, really has been part of mankind, part of Homo sapiens since its inception. One of the first real examples of it was 30 to 50,000 years ago when wolves became domesticated. Wolves would uh, find themselves around camps, get scraps of food, and then evolve. Uh, I mean, and then uh, sort of hang around, and man began to breed them so that they became more docile and became real partners. Uh, 10,000 years ago or so, when villages were first being created, there were efforts to control crops. And the Egyptians, for instance, bred corn for different color kernels. They thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Uh, in 1866, Gregor um, Mendel, who was an um, Austrian Augustinian monk, monk, did his famous experiments with peas, where he clearly showed that genetics gene transfer was the basis for so many of the differences that we see in, in the, within the same uh, species. We get different strains. And then in 53, um, Bill has mentioned the discovery of DNA, Watson and Crick and um, uh, Franklin, Rosalind Franklin, who really did the first uh, crystallography that, that helped with the DNA gene. In the 80s and 90s, uh, genetic modified um, organisms became part of what we deal with originally in corn and then in tomatoes. And it's important to know that even today, these are not totally accepted by some people because they're genetically modified by sticking DNA from an exterior source into them and modifying them in that way. Which CRISPR, which Bill Walker's gonna talk about, does not represent that same sort of uh, approach. And then in uh, 1996, Dolly the Sheep was cloned. That was such an exciting thing, most of you can remember that because it showed that you could take a single cell and in the right environment manipulate it to produce all the cells of an intact individual. A, um, a cell from a mammary gland in one strain of sheep was put into a de, uh, denucleated egg of an, uh, another sheep, implanted in a womb and carried to term and the baby, the dolly was born. And that has, it still has enormous potential for preserving uh, near extinct species and producing, in some cases, a better strain of uh, animal. Now, <clears throat> the quest for, the quest for, uh, the quest for uh, manipulating genes has taken a dramatic, um, much more sophisticated approach recently with the development of, of CRISPR. Uh, and, also, there are about 10,000 genes that have been identified, uh, 10,000 diseases, human diseases, that have been identified with single gene abnormalities, a mutation in a single gene. One of the ones that Bill will mention and I'll mention that we are particularly interested in is sickle cell disease, which is due to one amino acid substitution that, and results in an abnormal hemoglobin. Uh, 
how do you treat that? How do you try to use what we understand about genes to take care of that? Well, it's interesting. One of the first examples of how we do that was done in, here at St. Jude with Dr. Lynn Johnson, where he was part of the transplant team. And they transplanted a young woman who had, I think, acute lymphocytic leukemia and sickle cell. And lo and behold, not only was her malignancy cured, but her sickle cell was cured. So they stuck a gene in her, infused uh, a gene in, uh, in her through a uh, haploid, uh, through a good uh, HLA match, and two conditions were, were modified. There have been a lot of efforts to try to develop bone marrow transplant therapy to treat sickle cell disease. And it's been really difficult because there are a lot of negative things that happen with marrow transplant. But as we'll see with CRISPR technology, there's a good chance they might actually be able to do uh, more with that. CRISPR technology has, um, is really a result of studies in the 80s and 90s. And finally, in 2012, uh, Jennifer Doudner and Emmanuel uh, Charpentier, who was actually a, a postdoctoral fellow at St. Jude for a short period of time, discovered what Bill's going to talk about, the CRISPR system, and showed how it could actually be used in humans to, um, human cells, to um, break DNA and remove certain genes. And in 2020, they were jointly uh, given the Nobel Prize. And with all Nobel Prizes, there's a lot of politics associated with that because there are a lot of other people who have done incredible work to help them get to where they were. So uh, what we have now is a situation where CRISPR can be used to not only slice a gene out, but insert a better gene. And Bill will explain how that uh, process works. Uh, I don't think we need to go through the history of, of CRISPR specifically here. And Dr. Walker, you take over. These are three very old men sitting up here. <laughs> right. Hey, Bill, can you help me? <laughs> what, uh, I want to start off by saying it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, indeed, I do have 4% Neanderthal genes. 4% of my genes are Neanderthal, which turns out to be not that strange. When I told my daughters that uh, their father had 4% Neanderthal, I said, that explains why I dragged my knuckles around the house. And Heather got very upset. She'd think that was fun. Okay. Um, well, brief, uh, we have briefly reviewed CRISPR, and I'm going to start off so that we're all kind of on the same field and familiar with the terminology. Okay. With the terminology, uh, just what a cell is, what the DNA is, what the nucleus is, just to kind of get everybody in up. So here's a, whoops, the wrong thing. There it is. Pointer. Oh, that's one. Oh, it might be in there. Yeah. That black thing. There. Thank you. So a cell uh, contains uh, all the goodies in the cytoplasm, and most importantly for us in this talk, it has a nucleus, 23 sets of chromosomes uh, in the nucleus, 23 from the parent, each parent, and this is the chromosome. And the DNA stretches out like this, and the gene is just a section of that DNA, just a section of it, okay? And uh, contains the DNA, which stores all the genetic information. This is an example of, again, the same type of thing. And you'll see now letters coming up, and the letters are the bases. These are the bases. This is the code. Code. And there's only four bases you have to remember about A, T, G, and C. That's the four-letter code. No one could believe that that was a code before Watson and Crick because it's so simple. So simple. Everybody was trying to make it very complicated. But in fact, as we usually know now, it is... Oops, oh, wrong way. Sort section of DNA is a gene. Genes determine our traits, hair color, height, body, everything about you. 
Genes play a role in personal, uh, person's risk of some diseases. We'll talk a little bit about that. And we have somewhere in the 20 to 25,000 genes in our bodies. Okay, we're going to talk about molecules of interest because we're going to talk about DNA, RNA, and proteins. <clears throat> You've got to figure out what they are. Genes are composed of molecules of DNA. The inherited traits are encoded by the genes and transmitted from parent to offspring by reproduction. Gene expression, gene expression is the process by which the nucleotide bases of DNA, adenine, thymidine, guanine, cytosine, are translated into proteins. That's the whole idea. Make protein and make it under a controlled situation. Okay, so this is a diagram of DNA. First thing to know is that A always T's, always pairs with T, A, T, G with C. They pair like this, okay? Here's an example, T to A, G to C. You can see what Watson and Crick saw as soon as the, was, the pattern was established, their comment in the paper is we immediately saw a mechanism for what? Inheritance. There's a mechanism of inheritance. This is a space filling model. This is what DNA looks like. This is kind of a structure model. Again, you can see A pairing with T, G pairing with C, just like here. Now, if anybody that doesn't see something in here, please holler. We're very anxious to walk people through this. It's not, we know it's a difficult subject, but... Uh, Okay, so now how's this information flow? How do you get from DNA to protein? That's the issue. And there'll be some places in here which I will mention CRISPR as you'll see the mechanism by which its specificity arises. Okay? First, off to protein. A temporary copy of DNA is made. It is called messenger RNA. Messenger RNA, mRNA. Okay? It's made the same way as DNA is made in the sense it's got A, T, G, C, except in RNA, T, T is replaced with, cytos with uh, uracil. uracil. That's the only difference basically between the two as far as the code is concerned. And there's a reason for that because that uracil makes this molecule a little bit more unstable than DNA is. You know that you can go into a cave in Siberia, dig in the dirt, and you can sequence it. You can find DNA there. That's why we know there were Neanderthal and et cetera living in the caves. But you can't do it with RNA. RNA is extraordinarily labile, okay? If you see a scientist in the lab doing his RNA experiments, he or she are wearing gloves. And you say, oh, something's dangerous. Uh-uh. You're protecting the sample from you because your skin flakes. And you drop that into the tube, that's RNA so in there, and boom, it's going to fall apart. So you can ruin a lot of RNA experiments by not wearing gloves. That's why you see them doing that. Okay, so we make RNA. Next, the RNA is exported out of the nucleus. It gets transported out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. That's everything else outside the nucleus and inside the cell. Okay? Where it moves to a factory called the ribosomes. They are protein factories. They make the protein off the code from the RNA. Okay? So DNA to RNA to the ribosomes to protein. You can envision this process as a car moving down an assembly line. As it moves down the line, amino acids get added until at the end there is actually a sequence in the RNA which is called stop. And when the ribosome hits stop, off falls the protein. And the ribosomes start all over again. So it's a continuous operation, just like a factory. Okay? There's translated. So the language of the DNA is translated into the language of, the, of RNA, which is then translated into the language of protein. That's the flow. Everybody get that? <clears throat> 
Okay. All right. In my presentation, this is the most important slide. Okay. Note that the mRNA sequence can recognize its complementary, complementary DNA template strand sequence. Notice, here's the DNA template. This is the RNA. This is where CRISPR comes in. Because CRISPR uses the mRNA sequence to find the DNA of the virus. Okay? That's how specific it is. And it's very important to understand that. This, this slide tells basically what CRISPR is going to be doing. It's going to be using this to find that. A typical gene might be 50, 60 of these, but the RNA is going to batch it perfectly, absolutely perfectly. Okay? Has to do that. Okay. So we're going to digress off a little bit right now. Mutation is a change in the DNA sequence caused by causing the cell to function differently than it otherwise would. And mutations can result from all kinds of environmental influences, from sunlight, I suffer from that, malignant melanoma, boom. Grew up in California, you pay for a price for that. Okay, exposure to chemicals, radiation, uh, mistakes made in copying. The mutations happen in our cells all the time. Usually the cell detects the mutation and repairs it. Most of the time it can repair that damage. Okay? Okay, gang. So this is just another example of DNA to RNA to the functional protein. And in this particular example, there's a mutation that takes place up here, and a mutation ends up translated into the, uh, to the protein, so the protein doesn't work right. In sickle cell anemia, it's a set, it is a single base pair change, and the cells are now sickled. They don't flow through the circulation very well, and the patient suffers from that. And that's what we're going to, if we get around to it, we'll tell you how the first uh, cure for sickle cell took place. In Tennessee, by the way. This thing is. <clears throat> okay. Uh, natural mutations, that's mutations that occur in everybody all the time, can lead uh, to changing your phenotype, which you look like. Things like that. In, and uh, these, there can be beneficial ones that uh, improve you a little bit, and there can be examples of bad ones which you have a problem with. Uh, giraffes, for example, evolved long necks. Uh, this was an interesting argument in Darwin's time, why the giraffe had such a long neck. Uh, some people argued that the giraffe stretched its head to eat the good leaves up there, and somehow that was passed down to its offspring. Uh, other people said no, and experiments were actually done to test that in mice or rats, cut off their tails and breed them go through generations and generations and the tails stayed the same length. So that was the first test of what was called use and disuse that you could do something like that. And that goes back in the early 1800s. Uh, synthetic mutations, uh, I've heard it, CRISPR being an example and CRISPR has been used for improvements in agriculture and the treatment of diseases. Uh, the first case of successful treatment of uh, sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia done in Tennessee, in Nashville at a, a clinical hospital, does nothing but clinical trials, uh, led to a cure in a woman 35 years old. Well, now we want to get down to the nuts and bolts of what is CRISPR. And this is going to take a little study on your part. Okay. Okay, clustered. We've already been through what it all means. But I want you to note that there's this big red blob up here and that's called CAS9. CAS stands for CRISPR associated and number nine. There are now many CAS and Hank just told me we're up in the thousands. thousands. So it's an interesting phenomenon. This is an endonuclease. A nuclease is an enzyme that cuts DNA. And CAS is unique because it cuts both strands 
Remember the strands the DNA you saw wound up? It cuts both strands at the same spot. So you get an instant double break. Instant double break. Now, how does Cas find where it wants to cut? Remember the RNA? Remember the RNA, messenger RNA? It gets a piece of messenger RNA, which is this streak right here, which is then attached in the cell, in the bacterium, as it's growing. We should say from the beginning, and it's my fault I didn't do it, CRISPR is an adaptive immune system in bacteria. Bacteria, just like us, has to face what? Viruses. They have to face viruses. You have a wonderful immune system made up of T cells, B cells, macrophage, and all these other fancy cells that protect you. Viruses have to remember, bacteria have to remember the viruses that attacked them in a previous life. Okay? They have to protect themselves because they're in a battle all the time. Millions of viruses around them at all the time. And we'll come back to exactly where this comes from, but this is an RNA sequence that directs it to the particular point. Cas can unwind the DNA, finds its match, and as soon as it attaches like that, the RNA back to the DNA of the virus, bang, cuts it. And it's, it's, it has memory because that's from some previous virus of the same exact genetic type, okay? That makes sense? It's tough. Okay, all this cluster stuff and all that, palindromes and all that, are all right here. Clustered, regular, inner space, short, palindromic, repeats. Do you know what a palindrome is? Reads front and back. Okay, it's exactly the same. When a palindrome gets made in, R, in, the, in a single strand of DNA or a single strand of RNA, it can loop. Okay, A to T, G to C. Always got to remember that. If I make a nice molecule that long and it's palindromic, means it can loop. And you have thousands of looped RNAs in your system. You got some looped DNAs, but you got some really weird looking RNA molecules that look like uh, you know, ice crystals floating around. And they're fascinating. Okay, so you can see spacer, 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 and in between them are what are called repeats. Repeats are repeats. Finally, the proper use of the language in this thing is that the repeats repeat. And what do they encode for? They're identical. They're absolutely identical repeats. This is what floored the Japanese investigator and the guy from Spain when they saw this thing of absolute repeats. What are they? And they're identical. Same. Every single one of them is the same. What that code is, is forms a palindrome, and they form a loop. And the loop is what binds the Cas. Okay? In between the repeats are called spacers. Each spacer is different in its sequence. And what is it a sequence of? A previous virus that infected that bacteria at some time in its past. That's where the specificity comes from. It's because loop, virus one. Loop, virus two. Loop, virus three. Right there, that bacteria that has that sequence in it right there can protect itself from three different viruses by directly doing that. Okay, so what happened? Well, Hank and I were talking a little bit earlier. Could you imagine when Doudna and, and uh, uh, Carpentier realized that this system allowed them to do what? They can find, they can edit any DNA sequence in, in any plant or animal that they want. Why? If I know a DNA sequence, uh, let's just to make one up. Maybe we have a nice DNA sequence up there, and there's a mutation there causing a problem for you. I can find it because I can go to my computer 
type in the DNA sequence, say, find me the messenger RNA that matches that sequence, out pops the sequence. Okay, and the machine will manufacture that for you. And we'll also add on to the end of that RNA, the repeat. So you now get a loop and a message. And that loop's gonna fit in where? Into CAS. Okay, you just gave CAS a GPS system to find whatever that RNA tells it to find. And if it finds it, bang, cuts it. It's beautiful. This is an adaptive immune system, just like your T cells and B cells. You do it a little more fancy, but this is just as good. Okay, does everybody see that now? I know it's a, it's a bear, but one of these days, Okay, so this is the whole ball of wax right here. If one knows 20 to 30 bases of DNA, okay, a DNA sequence of interest, could be in an animal to make it bigger, smaller, whatever, or plant, one can make a complementary guide, it is called guide RNA, guide RNA molecule, couple it to a, a hairpin loop, that binds to Cas9 nuclease, which represents the scissors, okay, and have a highly specific gene editing or gene, uh, have a gene editing or gene cutting tool, okay? So that's where the specificity comes from. That RNA drives the specificity. DNA to RNA to protein, and that intermediary can go backwards and be used to detect the gene. Okay, so this is an example. Here's our gene of interest, just a little, that. here's the guide RNA. So here's the gene of interest. Notice it's complementary to this DNA. It's got a hairpin loop in it, and it's got a Cas9. Ready to go. If it sees that sequence, it will chop it. And you can do what's called gene knockout, which means you just turn off the gene, eliminate it. And if, you can, if it's a gene that you can live without, but it's causing you trouble, bingo. Okay? Is that it? Okay, this is back to the... Okay. okay. I'm glad this has been taped so you can go through this again and again and get ready for your test. But two days ago, we had a palindromic paradigm. It was December the 2nd, 2021. Is that right? Yeah, if you go that backwards, it's the same. So maybe we were looped um, two days ago. I was looped yesterday, but two days ago I was looped. Um, we, we talked about... Um, Potential uses of CRISPR, and Hank and Bill both talked about crops and animals and how things can be fixed and sickle cell anemia, and they're using this for a lot of diseases now. They're doing tests on it. But um, the big question is, does this mean we can create our own uh, babies who, have, who are tall, blue-eyed, strong, intelligent uh, good personality. We're not there yet. But it, this is a slippery slope. Um, and there's been a lot of ethical and theological issues of surrounding this whole question of CRISPR. Uh, are we playing God? Uh, is it really right for us to make decisions for our offspring's uh, phenotype or structure, body, and so on? There are two barriers on the slippery slope. One is whether this CRISPR technology is going to be used for somatic or even with germline uh, activity. Somatic is actually moving CRISPR into someone's body to protect them from a disease they have and maybe to, as Bill would say, switch off that gene and then they could perhaps be healed. And so this somatic cells are cells that are not tied to the egg, the sperm, or the embryo. Germline 
barrier or germline cells would actually change the future offspring uh, because you would be changing the genes that then would be produced and developed into the future generations. That's a huge, huge decision. And so where on this slippery slope are we? We look at also disease and enhancement. Obviously, I would think as good stewards, we'd want to be rid of disease, or would we? I mean, who are we? Sometimes our disease identifies who we are. Should that be, should that be left to the individual choice or to the government? Uh, but then you to ask even harder question, what about enhancements? You know, I have flat feet. I wish I could have run the marathon yesterday. If, if that had been changed before I was born, I wouldn't have had a choice on it, but I kind of like my flat feet. I can stand pretty well with them. But would that be a decision that my parents should make? Or how does that work? Where do we stop on this slippery slope? Those are big questions. Um, and the bioethical peoples uh, really started in about 1980s, and they come up with a structure of four key decision points or questions to look at this slippery slope. One is, is non-maleficence. I had to learn how to spell it, say that. But maleficence is, are, is this harmful? Is, will this be bad for the body? And you want to make sure that whatever you do with CRISPR is not harmful. And they don't really know the, what the consequences will be out there in germline uh, intervention. Uh, and that's going to take a lot of study. But is it harmful? And the second is beneficence. In other words, is it good for life? Is it good for society? Is it good for the person? And the third was um, the respect for autonomy. Whose decision is this? I want, I want to do this or not. Uh, we, we see the respect for autonomy with some of our current issues uh, in abortion and other, other issues where there have been a lot of back and forth on stem cell uh, work in the past decade. Uh, injustice. Uh, What's fair here? If, if I can afford to, to have my offspring tall, blue-eyed, or whatever enhancement I need, and you can't afford it, where do we stop? Where's the slippery slope? What works, what works there? Which brings up theological questions. One of my favorite um, mantras is from a Rachel, Dr. Rachel Raymond. You've heard me say this, I think that uh, her aim in life is to pursue unanswerable questions in good company. Well, I would add with people I love, or I would add with God as my Savior, or I would add, but still, I don't think we'll ever get certainty in our lives, total certainty, certainly about death, but also about a lot of things. But there are some open-ended questions we ought to be grappling with. Um, where are we on this slippery slope right now? Where will we be in five or ten years? 20 years. Where will, we, where will our children, our offspring be in terms of this slippery slope of CRISPR? Big question. Um, are we playing God? Are the scientists playing God? Who should be playing God? Are we playing God? I don't know. Those are good questions. We have, um, we, in Genesis, we talk about being created in God's image. Um, but we're also asked in Genesis by God to be stewards, stewards of our land, our plants animals, and even of ourselves. Uh, a good steward would want to be rid of disease, but we're on that slippery slope. Where do we stop? Where do we start? I was thinking about uh, this the other day, and I was thinking, you know, when Jacob was wrestling with this angel, he didn't know what the answer was, but he knew he had to wrestle with this angel. But after the angel dislocated his hip or wounded him some way, and he had that limp, he then said, my God, God was there and I didn't even know it. So we are asked in some ways to wrestle with these issues, but also be aware of the presence of God in our lives and who we are. There's a wonderful quote by Barbara Holmes, who's an African-American theologian, um, spiritualist, and actually she calls herself a cosmologist. But I love what she says that life is a fragile orb and our sphere of being includes both stardust and consciousness. Um, there's a spark of divinity within all of us, a flicker of holy fire that can be, dis, dis, can be diminished but never extinguished. Uh, 
certainly, I don't have the answer, and I don't think you can just say, okay, I got it now, I understand it all. But in some ways, we do have within us this divine light, and that's what carries us forward, and that's what life is, regardless of all of the ACTGs and the genetic transfers. There's something there that's much more powerful that's in all of us. And so I'd like to answer or hold up any questions and have Hank and Bill particularly to, to answer questions you may have. So it's open for it's open season for, for questions. Yes, sir. Has this technique been used yet in humans? And if so, what was the role, what was the attitude of the scientific community? Yes, it was, well, there's been two major uses of it. One, well, uh, in China, uh, Dr. He uh, used CRISPR to modify two females uh, to knock out the CCR5 gene, which is the co-gene, co-protein to take HIV in, along with the other molecule into cells. We do not, he's been in jail uh, when it was discovered and he did that. It was, he announced it at a meeting in I think Hong Kong and uh, it was an international meeting. Uh, Doudna was there I believe and uh, they just freaked out. The, the international community just absolutely freaked out and conferences were established, etc., cetera, uh, for germline editing. Uh, in contrast, uh, it has been used in sickle cell disease and is curative. And it was a very interesting way they did it. They didn't knock out any gene. Uh, they just put the brake on a transcription factor which uh, uh, shut off fetal hemoglobin synthesis in humans as you transition from a fetus to an adult, and that worked beautifully. That turned off, the woman is, uh, has about 40%, last time I saw it, about 40 or 45% fetal hemoglobin, hemoglobin cells, which is sufficient, to, you just need about a little bit over 25, I gather, to, to function normally, and she is, no more transfusions, no more pain, nothing, and she's walking around, she's from central Mississippi. So that's the two examples that I'm familiar with. I know Hank, but Hank has others. Yeah, there's a, a couple of very rare diseases in children, a certain form of blindness that's been treated at, at the uh, University of Oregon. And the early reports are that at least individuals had the treatment for the longest period of time can now see colors, or think she can, and can see images, which in the past she could not. The same thing, there's a, a congenital form of deafness that's been treated with this. But as I said, there are 10,000 human conditions, I'm sure, and, and so, most of them are so rare that we don't pay much attention to them. But hemochromatosis, cystic fibrosis, those are all single gene defects. And ultimately, I think all of them will be treated. One of the things that's happening now is with the manipulation of fetal hemoglobin and with insertion of a normal sickle gene, a normal hemoglobin gene, and with these others, they're, they're limiting the number of people who will have these therapies to 20, two dozen at most. And they're going to follow them for three to five years because the concern is we, we don't know what we don't know. And there's a possibility that by doing this, even though we don't recognize it currently, there may be unintended consequences. So rather than opening it up for everybody, I think very judiciously it will be slowly uh, established, yeah. Although mankind is so bizarre, <laughs> everybody may want, I want my shot. I want to kill, but I want to make my knees better. <laughs> I, I will also build to the point Bill was making, Bill Craddock was making, in Isaacson's book, uh, The Code Breaker, uh, Downer talks about a young man who has sickle cell disease that they brought up the concept of do you want therapy? And Early on, he said, no, sickle cell disease has made me who I am. Living through the pain, living through the stress, living through near-death events, that's who I am. I don't want it. 
Later on in the book, they re-interview him, and he says, I'm not so sure. I may really want that. <laughs> Other questions? Arrested. I don't know the full story of it, but so how is CRISPR regulated? Now that it's out, now that it's known, what do you see as the ways that it can be regulated? I can tell you that from what I've read, what I've read, uh, you cannot use federal funds from the federal government for any uh, germline editing. Can't do it. You can use private funds, but the problem would be that if you develop the therapy it wouldn't get by the FDA, so you wouldn't be able to, to use it. And Dr. He is in jail, last I heard. I don't know if he's out. Have you heard anything, Rob? He's still in jail. He's in for a three year period. period. Uh, he can no longer practice uh, medicine like this. He had a company which he lost, and I think he was fined uh, by about $300,000. But the difficulty is you can't get any information out of them. And the one would love to know how these young girls are doing and whether or not the, it was accomplished. Was the goal accomplished? Did he knock out the uh, co-receptor for HIV infection? Is that out? I uh, have a comment and a question. It's my understanding that the federal government will allow studies for somatic cell intervention, I'll call it, CRISPR, uh, but not for germline. Uh, however, the question is what I've read is that now you can, in your garage, build your own CRISPR program, uh, order your synthetic RNA, you remember? Synthetic RNA and put it together in code, cut and paste like you would Word on your computer, cut and paste, um, and build your own um, genetic editing factory. And without any regulation, if as long as you don't have federal funding, you could end up with your Dalai sheep or whatever you want, the Dalai Lama. Um, and that's really scary. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I'd also add that uh, some of the leading investigators in this field uh, have worked with international groups to try to develop some policies that say this is what we should be doing and this is what we shouldn't be doing. And that carries the weight of some real thought leaders saying just what Bill was trying to make the point. Let's hold up. Let's make sure we know what we're doing because otherwise there would be a real tendency for everybody to go in all sorts of directions. So one, one other question um, I would have is, what is the church doing? What is the Episcopal Church? What are the churches doing with this issue? This ought to be a public policy. Uh, the public ought to be involved, but I think the church should provide some guidance too. And um, I think this is an issue that ought to be brought up uh, in the diocese, Scott, and in, in the national church. Uh, we ought to begin to build on that. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I do. I'm, I'm terrified. No, I'm, it's a fascinating. I'm, I'm, um, as you describe these controls, and then thank you for playing it out, that they seemed fairly flimsy. And, um, you know, going back to ancient, the ancient myths from Icarus to the Tower of Babel, there's been a deep human worry that we might not be able to be trusted with our power, right? Uh, and um, the broader scientific question, I guess, and, and I think climate change has become both the reality and the myth of our time that, that, that worries us that we can't be trusted if we have good intentions. And, 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 um, so I'll say that and then say, what, um, how does the scientific community put its guardrails on? You've, you've addressed a few of them, but you've also expressed some worry that they really can't keep it contained. Um, and, and how do we take seriously what we don't know? Um, and is there a place for ethical discourse outside the scientific community, whether it's the church or religious traditions or others, that would actually be uh, received as relevant? Um, 
It seems like great human characters are going to need to be developed to be good stewards of whatever power we have. Is that a question? Uh, what are the, within the scientific community, what's, what's being listened to? It's a tough, it's a tough, very tough issue. And uh, guardrails people are discussing continually. You can Google it. If you Google CRISPR, you can go, there are thousands of citations that in there about this precise issue. How is this to be regulated? Particularly when you can go online and for $125, I think, about 99, 99 on sale, a, a, a CRISPR kit. You can go online to people who will make your synthetic RNA if you know the gene sequence you're interested in and will come in a box and be delivered by FedEx. That's, that's tough. You know, a, a bit of an analogy uh, goes back with the sequencing of the genome. The guy who was leading that was a guy named Craig Benter. And he was, he clearly was in it. I mean, he's brilliant. But he's clearly in it to, to develop a commercial product where we could, we could all know what our genome's like, where you could sell this, that, and the other. And um, the NIH, under the direction of Dr. Francis Collins, was trying to do the same thing. They weren't quite as quick as what Bentner had done. And I think it was, was it Bill Clinton? Bill Clinton got the two of them together and knocked some heads and said, we've got to get this under control so that we don't have this far out entrepreneurial kind of thing, which really is what helped drive the whole thing dramatically. Uh, in this plotting federal research standard, make it as tightly controlled as you possibly can, and somehow they worked it out. And I don't know if there's a room for that because it, there are no single individuals you can identify like the NIH and Vintner. So, uh, but it shows that with the right kind of thought and the right kind of leadership, you might be able to modify some of these um, situations. Well, thank you, Bill and, and Hank, for uh, giving us a peek through the window of this thing called CRISPR. Um, we really appreciate it, and thank you for your questions, and hope we can do it again someday and have a good outcome.